Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Friday. And it's a Friday, first Friday in March. Very exciting. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath. You probably knew that. Uh, my guest this week is Anna Lemke, who is a professor at, let me just make sure I've got this right. She's an American psychiatrist. Uh, she got her degree in the humanities from Yale, went to Stanford Medical School, and is currently the uh, chair of the Addiction Medicine Fellowship. Do I have that right? The, yes, the Addiction medicine dual diagnosis clinic and then we also have a fellowship yes that's great that's great thank you um and most recently she is the author of a best-selling book called dopamine nation uh which really takes you i just finished it and really takes you under the hood of how we get addicted what that means how the brain works um and some ways out which i think is very very positive um so but before we get to that i thought it would be fun for people to hear about your first book because you were one of the very first medical professionals to to recognize that that we were actually on the brink of a real opioid crisis and what how that came to be um and i think maybe just a few minutes on that book and sort of how that led to this book sure <laughs> yeah great. well so that first book was published in 2016 it was called drug dealer md how doctors were duped patients got hooked and why it's so hard to stop and I really hadn't had any particular aspirations to write a book, but I realized that there were things that I felt people needed to know about that would never get published in a peer review medical journal. So I decided to sort of venture off the beaten path and say, okay, I, I need to sort of both explain what happened in terms of why um, opioid prescribing for minor and chronic pain conditions increased starting in the late 1990s leading to the opioid epidemic that we, um, you know, we are still in today. Um, and I felt like it was really important to kind of like, for, for myself intellectually, but also for, you know, other physicians, patient consumers, for us to take a really hard look at, wow, you know, what happened in medicine that well-intentioned healthcare providers all of a sudden started writing way too many opioid prescriptions. And, and that's essentially uh, what that book is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, it's fascinating. And of course, we've seen the aftermath now. Yes. And it's this, this sort of unholy alliance of, of the profit motive, um, new technological capabilities, and kind of our institutions being behind. I mean, this is something I study a lot. And mm. it takes like 25 years before we wake up to the reality of what's going on. So yeah. we're seeing it today with things like social media, right? And third right. party use of private content and, yes. and, and, you know, we'll get there, but it just, it's a frustratingly long period of time before the regulatory mechanisms catch up with what's actually happening. Yes. Agreed. It's a very slow turning ship. I'm glad you're optimistic that we actually will learn from our mistakes. I'm hopeful, but um, the profit motive is so deeply embedded in modern American healthcare mm -hmm. that I am a little skeptical um, even now, um, we're starting to see opioid prescribing, you know, inch back up again. And so I'm just, you know, concerned. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm concerned as well. And uh, I've re recently written about, for example, insulin. I mean, mm -hmm. it is crazy to me that a hundred year old drug that it should have been off patent decades ago mm -hmm. um, is manufactured by only three basically manufacturers. Um, they've created this thicket of patents around the delivery mechanisms predominantly, and people are literally dying because they're not able to get what should be by now a commodity medicine, um, at least in the United States. Interesting. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's a mm -hmm. terrible situation. I mean, it's another one of those, how how do we let this happen kind right. of moments. Yeah, <laughs> kind of <a> mystifying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so before we get into the book, I thought it would be great if you wouldn't mind educating us a little on um, what you call the the um the 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 sort of balance. Sure. between pain and pleasure in our in our brains and the neurotransmitters that sort of regulate that. I think, I mean, I learned a lot reading about that and I think it would be very beneficial for people to hear too. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our brains have evolved over millions of years of evolution to approach pleasure and avoid pain. And we do that reflexively without, without having to give it any thought, even outside of conscious awareness. And indeed, you know, that ability has, uh, has allowed us to survive over millions of years. Um, 
what's exciting in neuroscience in the past 75 years or so is the kinds of insights that we've gathered in terms of how, how that process works, how we, how we actually um, approach pleasure and avoid pain. And one of the most interesting findings in neuroscience in the last 50 to 75 years or so is that um, pleasure and pain are co-located in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So imagine like a, a beam on a central fulcrum, kind of like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground. And when we experience pleasure, um, the balance tilts one way. And when we experience pain, it tilts another. But there are several rules governing this balance. And the first and most important rule is that the balance wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be deviated very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And after any deviation from neutrality, which is essentially the biological definition of stress, our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. And here's the key, the way that our brains go back to the level position after any deviation from neutrality is first by tipping an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So for example, I really like chocolate. When I eat a piece of chocolate, my balance tilts slightly to the side of pleasure. In my brain, in a part of my brain called the reward pathway, our dopamine is released. Dopamine is our reward neurotransmitter. And you know, I, I feel good. But no sooner has that happened than my brain adapts to that increased dopamine by actually down-regulating my dopamine receptors. And I like to imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. But the thing about the gremlins is they like it on the balance so they don't hop off as soon as I've restored neutrality. They stay on until my balance is tipped hmm. an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that's that moment of craving another piece of chocolate, right? Now, if I wait long enough, the gremlins hop off, homeostasis is restored, and I kind of move along in my day. But what if I don't stop there? What if I continue to ingest chocolate in larger and larger amounts over days to weeks to months to years? What happens is, then this is the second rule of the balance, with repeated exposure to the same or similar stimulus, that initial deviation to pleasure gets weaker and shorter, but that after response gets stronger and longer. In other words, that little gremlin that hopped on the pain side of the balance originally is now like lifting weights and he's like turning into a little Arnold Schwarzenegger gremlin and also more gremlins are piling on, right? And that is what happens when we get into this cycle of addiction, that we end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room and they're camped out there. They're not going away you know, anytime soon. So that even now in between the times when I'm not using my drug, I'm walking around with the balance tilted to the side of pain. Now I need to use more of the drug, more potent forms of the drug not even to feel good or get high, but just to restore neutrality and feel normal. And when I'm not using, I'm walking around in a state of pain, experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and intrusive thoughts of my drug, uh, sometimes called craving. And this is in essence what happens uh, when people become addicted, or even in the state of sort of minor compulsive overconsumption that we all face now in various forms. The other feature of this phenomenon is that other things lose their salience. So um, when I'm, you know, when I've eventually um, gone into this dopamine deficit state, and it's literally a dopamine deficit state that we have a functional imaging studies showing that, um, you know, there's a decrease in D2 receptors, a decrease in dopamine transmission in the reward pathway with repeated exposure to highly reinforcing uh, drugs. So when I'm walking around like that, other things, more modest pleasures are no longer pleasurable. Like eating chocolate, for example, really isn't pleasurable for, for me anymore. Right now I need to continually uh, up the ante. Um, so, so that's essentially what's going on in the brain, um, you know, as we become addicted.
That is fascinating. And that I guess that motivated the title of the book. Um, for those of you that don't know it yet, um, it's it's <coughs> it's a fascinating read. Um, it kept me kept me going on an airplane <laughs> back and forth to Arizona <laughs> just recently. Um, and you and I love that explanation. Thank you. That's that's super helpful because I think a lot of people don't. You know, they, they, there's a lot of stuff about sort of moral judgment and willpower and, you know, all these things that I think make people who are in the grips of these addictions so uh, unwilling to admit it, unwilling to be honest, and you talk about that in the book, um, and unwilling to get help because they think they should be able to be strong enough to overcome or something. And and if well, your chemistry is against you, I don't know how you Yes. Do yeah, I think that's really the key, that this physiology is so ancient and so powerful, and it can really hijack, you know, our reward systems. Once we've gotten into that dopamine deficit state, it's very, very difficult to withstand the pull of that mm -hmm. um, without some kind of, you know, additional support. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's really, you know, the, the primary message. A lot of times people are saying, well, why is this person addicted? You know, what, what happened in their childhood or, you know, what, what's, you know, what's wrong with their life and certainly, you know, developmental um, factors can increase the risk of addiction. Everybody knows about trauma being a factor. Certainly there are genetic risks for addiction, a co-occurring mental illness increases, you know, the risk of becoming addicted. There are environmental factors beyond access to the drug, like unemployment and poverty, which increase the risk of, of getting addicted. But one of the risk factors, which is so important in the world we live in today, which is often forgotten, is just simple access to the drug. If you have access to a drug, you are more likely to use it. You are more likely to get addicted to it. And addiction is a primary progressive disease. We don't need another explanation to understand the disease process, we need the pathophysiology of what's happening in the brain, which is its own disease process. And once people get caught in that vortex, very, very difficult to get out. That is fascinating. So it, it, it doesn't really matter how you got there. Let's recognize that you're there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and how you yeah. go uh, past it. And um, the first the first part of the book begins with what I thought was a rather bold title, uh, Our Masturbation Machines. And uh, the gentleman who features in that sort of appears as a character throughout. But, you know, came... Well, I'd love you to describe his case, but I mean, at the end, he was he was actually considering suicide. I mean, it wasn't this harmless thing. I mean, it brought him to the brink of despair. Yes. So let me start by saying all of the uh, patient stories in my book are real stories. Only the names have been changed. And I've shared those stories with the active participation and consent of my patients. Um, including interviews that were done outside of clinical care. So I just want to, you know, explain that and also express gratitude to my very generous patients who are willing to share their stories in order to help others. Um, so I do open with the story of, of Jacob, a, a man in his mid 60s, who uh, had struggled through much of his life with compulsive masturbation. Um, but really it wasn't until the advent of the internet and smartphones and this kind of 24 seven access to pornography um, that his life spun out of control. He, he's a scientist um, and he builds things. And so he, he built, indeed built a masturbation machine. And the reason I call that chapter our masturbation machines is because, um, you know, I don't think the rest of us are all that different from Jacob in the sense that we are now plugged in with our own devices, which we use to sort of auto stimulate ourselves in all kinds of ways to the exclusion of connection with uh, other human beings, even in the context. And this is, I think, really one of the most important undercurrents of my message, even to the exclusion of having great people in our lives, right? So it's not like, you know, um, we're engaging in these devices as a last resort. We can have wonderful spouses and wonderful children and wonderful friends, and yet still find ourselves caught up uh, in this kind of internet world with strangers where we're, we're sort of titillating ourselves in a variety of ways. Um, and so that's why I opened with the book. I wanted to humanize uh, sex and um, sex addiction. Um, I talk also about my own 
identification with Jacob because in my early 40s, I found I found myself compulsively reading romance novels. I got a Kindle that escalated that. And I eventually progressed to really compulsive overconsumption of erotica. That wasn't really consistent with my values. It was interfering with my ability to, I would stay up late at night, you know, reading. I, I was less and less to engage in my work and with my family. And of course, this all happened sort of outside of my conscious awareness. So I, I, I wanted to make that identification between myself and Jacob and also, you know, all of us, um, if, if we're willing to kind of look hard at, mm -hmm. at the ways that we engage now with our devices. Yeah. And I think anybody could relate to that. I mean, we've all, yeah. you know, anything from Netflix binging right, yeah. to watching those like totally hypnotic TikTok clips. Yes. <laughs> I find myself right. like I'll run across one by total accident and I'm there for, you know, it's 20 minutes have gone by. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm still there. But I think yes. it's that same sort of like, oh, I wonder if the next one's going to be as good as the last one. <laughs> right. Know? Exactly. So that, you know, it really engages our sort of uh, treasure hunting function and dopamine just sort of gets revved up. And then we get the sort of mini dopamine deficit state where then we're, you know, clicking on next episode, you know, next video, because we're we're essentially, we cannot separate because to separate would be to plunge into this dopamine deficit state, which is, you know, quite distressing and painful. Mm -hmm. um, you um, early on though, and let's, let's maybe perhaps talk a little bit about some of the things that have to happen for you to get sort of out of this and yeah. talk about a young um, a woman who um, was very kind of very addicted and it was really causing a lot of harm and um and her, her parents ended up getting involved and getting you involved um but she had to actually stop and she was very reluctant to do so um and yeah. what was interesting was how long like she would have relapsed out i, I suspect absent your intervention um are you talking about my, the patient delilah who was addicted yes. to cannabis okay yes. yeah mm -hmm. well so this gets at sort of what you know, the, 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 so this is sort of a dire news, you know, uh, this mismatch between our ancient wiring and our modern dopamine saturated ecosystem. So that then what to do about it. And basically what dopamine nation posits is that through a combination of understanding the neuroscience and also looking to people in recovery from addiction as modern day profits for the rest of us, we can, you know, there's something that we can actually do about, about this. And the reason that people with severe addiction and recovery are modern day prophets is because these are the individuals who are most vulnerable to this problem of compulsive overconsumption. And if they can figure out how to navigate, you know, this world, surely they have something to share with the rest of us. And I know I've learned an enormous amount from my patients. And so the first, really the first intervention that the book recommends, which is the first intervention I do with most, but not all patients, is to ask them to fast from their drug of choice, whatever it is, pornography, video games, social media, cannabis, alcohol, shopping, you know, you name it, um, to fast for that for 30 days. So why 30 days? Um, 30 days is in my clinical experience about the average amount of time it takes for those neuroadaptation gremlins who are now camped out on the pain side of the balance to start to dismount and for homeostasis to be re uh, restored. Why is it so important to restore this baseline homeostasis so that we can remember what it feels like to be not caught up in this intrusive craving state that is the, the sort of baseline state of a dopamine deficit condition, and also to be able to take pleasure in more modest rewards, as well as to be able to look back and see true cause and effect. So when we're caught up in our addiction, we really don't see it, its impact. We have to get some distance from it before we can look back and say, oh, wait a minute. Um, no, that, that seemed to have taken on a larger proportion in my life than I, than I realized or than I, than I wanted it to. Um, there's also science showing that um, two weeks is probably insufficient to reset dopamine reward pathways, but that four weeks is probably enough. There's a very famous imaging study done by Nora Volkoff, who's the head of uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, where she looks at dopamine transmission levels in the brains of people who had been addicted to very serious drugs like cocaine and heroin, 
And she images their brains two weeks after stopping. And what she shows is that they have decreased dopamine transmission in the reward pathway compared to healthy controls. In other words, their pleasure pain balance still has gremlins camped out on the pain side. Um, and that's consistent with my clinical experience, and which is why I will always warn patients, you're going to feel worse before you feel better, right? Because once we take away what's sitting on the pleasure side with all those gremlins on the pain side, you're just going to be, it's going to be hard, but you need to just endure, wait it out, tincture of time. Those gremlins will eventually hop off and homeostasis will be restored. And of course, by weeks three and four, that is exactly what happens. The vast majority of my patients will come back in feeling much, much better and also feeling surprised that they feel better. And this is really key. And this speaks to Delilah's situation because Delilah was, she came to see me for help with depression and anxiety. And she was absolutely convinced, this young woman, otherwise healthy young woman, that, uh, that cannabis was the only thing that worked for her depression and anxiety, that it was treating her. Because every time she used cannabis, it temporarily got her out of this dopamine deficit state. What she couldn't see was that it was indeed the cannabis that had created the dopamine deficit state in the first place. But when she abstained for four weeks, she came back and said, wow, in those first two weeks, I actually was vomiting in the first week, which number one made me realize that I had become physically dependent on cannabis, something I hadn't realized. And I felt terrible. And by weeks three and four, my anxiety and depression were so much better, better than they've been really in a very long time, which was then of course her aha moment. My goodness, it was actually the cannabis that was creating or at least significantly contributing to the depression and anxiety. So that's the key intervention. It's not the only intervention. I wouldn't do that intervention with somebody who had tried repeatedly to stop on their own and wasn't able to. Um, they would need like a rehab or some other higher level of care. I wouldn't do that intervention with somebody who was at risk for life-threatening withdrawal from like alcohol or benzodiazepines or somebody who needed a slow taper off of opioids. So, you know, there are lots of caveats to this kind of intervention, but I would do this intervention with somebody whose ultimate goal was to moderate consumption. So um, this is a big discussion in the field of addiction medicine. Can people with addiction you know, actually learn to moderate their consumption or do they have to abstain? It becomes especially relevant when we're talking about these devices, right? Which we probably can't abstain from in order to participate in modern life. So um, even if your goal, long-term goal is moderation, you need to start with that month of abstinence. Why? Because only that month of abstinence will reset reward pathways. And it's essential to restore baseline homeostasis before trying to re-engage in moderate consumption. It just doesn't work to go from using a lot to using less. People won't get there. But it's, if they go from they using a yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. You got it. But if they go from using a lot to using none and then see how much better they feel, then there's also that internal motivation to be able to engage in what I call self-binding strategies in order to, um, in order to moderate. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we can talk about that a little bit, which is the, the self-binding stuff, which yeah. is, you know, and then I guess this connects to some of the work that's been done about willpower, you know, showing that it actually is an exhaustible resource. And so yeah. the less you force yourself to rely on willpower, you know, just the more with that resource that you have and the easier things become. Um, and so things like uh, not keeping the addictive substance around or, or specifying when and where it can be used, that kind of thing. Yes, right. Yeah. So self-binding is this way of creating both literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice so that we can press the pause button between desire to consume and actually consuming. You know, I, um, you know, I'll have parents come in and say to me, my son won't stop playing video games, you know, no matter what we do, no matter what we say. And I have to explain to them, you know, as long as you have easy access to video games in the house and you have a child who's addicted to video games, it would be a superhuman feat for him to actually not play video games, right? Once we are in that state of craving with those gremlins, you know, happily hopping on the pain side of the balance, we cannot resist the pull. It is overwhelming. We're biologically designed to give into that pull 
in order to restore homeostasis. So what do we need to do? We need to actually put barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice to allow us to withstand that pull long enough for that acute craving to dissipate uh, for those gremlins to hop off and eventually with sustained abstinence to restore homeostasis. And then we can continue to use self-binding strategies um, you know, in the long term, even when we go back to moderation. And indeed, um, I had another patient, I don't talk about him in the book, but he's given me permission to share his story. I do share it in a Wall Street Journal op-ed piece that I wrote, um, where, uh, you know, he was actually, he dropped out of college, depressed, suicidal, um, came to see me, had been playing video games all of his waking hours, um, took that leap of faith that maybe it was the video games causing the problem, stopped video games for a month, felt so much better, decided to continue to abstain for the next four months. And actually he abstained from all screens. Um, he was very insightful. He realized that even if he put away his video game console and laptop and such, as long as he had a smartphone, he would be triggered by you know the, the phone itself, getting messages from his friends, watching YouTube videos of other people playing video games. So how does that work in the brain? Because we have a lot of science on this, which is really, really interesting. If a rat is trained to know that um, they can, that they, if they press a lever, they will get an infusion of cocaine. Of course, the rat will press the lever really until it dies. Um, if the rat is then trained to know that sometimes there's cocaine when they press the lever and sometimes there isn't, and when they see a light or hear a bell, that will tell them that if they go and press the lever, there's cocaine. So it's, it's, it's a cue induced kind of phenomenon, right? It's what we call a Pavlovian conditioned uh, learning. So the rat is conditioned to have learned to know that when it sees the light or hears the bell, cocaine will be available. So what's happening with dopamine and the gremlins when, when that's going on? Very, very fascinating. Um, by sticking a probe in the rat's brain and measuring dopamine levels through this process, what researchers have found is that when the rat sees the light, that is the indicator that a reward is coming, there's, a, there's euphoria. There's an increase in dopamine levels just anticipating the reward, followed very interestingly by a decrease in dopamine levels, not just to baseline, but below baseline. So that dopamine deficit state. So just being triggered by our drug sends us in this loop where the gremlins hop on the pain side of balance, which then induces the craving and craving is essentially the physiologic drive to do the work to get the drug. Patients will even tell me that euphoric recall alone, just remembering their drug use is enough to make them feel a little bit high and then feel craving. So the key with self-binding is to put these barriers in place so we're not constantly being triggered and getting in these mini loops of uh, you know, dopamine increase and then dopamine deficit and then craving. Um, and so this, this particular patient, when he finally went back to using video games in moderation, he used um, time as a way to self-bind. He decided to play only two days a week, only two hours a day. He used categorical self-binding, meaning that he would only play some games and not others. He would only play with friends and not strangers. And he used literal um, um, physical self-binding in the form of getting two laptops, one for school and one for games. And that way there was this kind of physical separation as well as the separation in his mind. And we, there are all kinds of ways that we can put these self-binding mm -hmm. um, barriers. And I have patients who, when they travel, will call hotels in advance and say, get rid of the mini bar. Uh, sometimes some patients will even say, get rid of the mini bar and the TV. Like, I don't want any access uh, to what you, you know, what you're offering there online. Cause that can be very dangerous. There's mm -hmm. also chemical self-binding. So we have drugs now that can actually bind and block certain receptors to help people, um, you know, be able to leverage their willpower. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of this very dramatic scene in the movie, The Social Dilemma, which is basically about how um, the social media companies have created these, just de deliberately created yes. this addictive response to hearing from your friends or what's the message or likes or whatever. And Facebook knows this. I mean, yes. they, re they have this huge amount of research which shows how bad this is for kids and for young women, for young girls, especially, and, 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 but there's this moment in the movie, The Social Dilemma, where the mom in the family is like, no, we're going to have dinner where we're actually going to talk to each other. And she locks up all the cell phones. Yes. And the kids are so distressed by this. They're like literally breaking into this box in the middle of the night. <laughs> they can't stand to be away from it. 
And I thought that was such a brilliant illustration of what you've just described. Right? Yes, exactly. Is that, you know, when you're in the grips of this addiction, it, it like you'll do anything to break into the barriers. Yeah. I, and it's, I think for listeners out there who can't self-identify with addiction or don't have a loved one or sort of don't get it, try putting your smartphone away just for 24 hours and self-observe uh, the, the kind of withdrawal that occurs. And remember that the universal symptoms of withdrawal are anxiety, irritability, restlessness, dysphoria, intrusive thoughts of all the reasons why it really makes sense that I should, you know, go turn on my smartphone, even though I committed to a day of not using um, that fear of missing out, which is really just another form of anxiety. Definitely. I have a, an acquaintance who um, vowed that she was going to get off uh, Twitter and, and deleted her account and asked her, you know, um, significant other to, 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 to not let her like look at it and everything. And within 24 hours, she was back to, I'm missing too much. I know. I know. <laughs> You're wrong without me. <laughs> but see what happens if people can write out that initial conviction that they're missing too much and get to that place where the gremlins start to hop off, really, something really amazing happens. And it's exactly what happens to my patients when they get into robust recovery. They're much more able to be present in the moment. Their thinking clears up. It's like, it's like the garbage collectors have come by and cleared out like a bunch of mental garbage. They're not in this reactivity mode, but actually have a, able to have a sustained, creative, original thought things kind of quiet down, their relationship with time changes, all of a sudden they have so much more time, which in a way can be scary because it's like, oh, what do I do with you know all of this time? But of course, in a way is wonderful because time is really our most precious commodity. So you also talk about the other side of the spectrum, which was something I had never read about before, which is sometimes we push on the pain lever yeah. So the first, so the book is very prescriptive and the first prescription is this abstinence trial, but the second prescription is um, essentially hormesis and hormesis is Greek for to set in motion. And it's a whole science around the ways in which exposing ourselves to mild to moderate doses of noxious or painful stimuli can actually be very good for us and very healthy and cause our bodies to start to upregulate production of our own endogenous dopamine and other feel-good neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, our endocannabinoid system, our endoopioid system. And essentially the way to think about this is that those gremlins are agnostic to whatever the initial stimulus is. If the initial stimulus is an intoxicant, they will hop on the pain side to try to restore homeostasis. But if the initial stimulant is a painful stimulus like exercise, or an ice cold water bath, or intermittent fasting, or a cognitively challenging task, or an emotionally challenging task, then those gremlins will happily hop on the pleasure side in order to restore homeostasis. And so by doing that in regular small doses, that is to say, pressing on the pain side in regular small doses, we can actually reset our reward pathways toward the side of pleasure or at least keep ourselves from dipping into this kind of a chronic dopamine deficit state, which is so prevalent in our world today. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you use the story in the book about this guy who um, uh, started off with like a cold shower and then it yes. got a cold bath and then it got to be a bath where he had to like crack through the ice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So interesting. Um, yeah, so this was a man who had an addiction to cocaine and alcohol and was in the early stages of recovery, which is very painful as I've talked about. And then sort of serendipitously discovered that an ice cold shower in the morning made him feel in his words, like as good as taking a Vicodin, right? And so it was a real discovery for him that by exposing himself to this very painful, very cold water, um, he could feel better for a while. And in fact, you know, from the perspective of a homeostasis, even in the early stages of trying to abstain from our drug of choice, if we then intentionally engage in things that are hard or painful, we're probably going to speed up the process of restoring homeostasis because we'll have those gremlins hopping on the pleasure side. And there are data showing that people who engage in vigorous exercise um, while they're trying to withdraw from addictive substances have less, have fewer withdrawal symptoms and have a shorter duration of feeling like they're in withdrawal. Um, we also know that um, 
young people who actively engage in exercise are much less likely to go on to develop an addictive disorder. So there's probably a preventive component there. That's but yeah, yeah. But as as highlighted with this with this man who, because you know, he had the propensity to do things in excess, he kept pushing the envelope, right? So first he he was ice cold showers and then it was ice cold baths, adding ice cubes. And then he got himself like a meat cooler with a motor to keep it circulating so that, you know, it stayed really cold. And it was very cute because as he was talking about, it, he said, wow, that almost sounds like, you know, I'm getting addicted to cold water. Could I be getting addicted to cold water? And it is actually possible to get addicted to pain. We, we see that, you know, sometimes I have patients who have gotten addicted to exercise, exercise at the point where they have, you know, stress fractures, but they aren't stopping um, exercising to the point where it just becomes very obsessional. They go into withdrawal and when they're not exercising in a, in a way that's intolerable to them. Um, I've had, you know, this whole, no, this whole idea of like adrenaline junkies is essentially getting addicted to a form of pain. There's also kind of, there's a sort of a modern day form of an adrenaline junkie, which is a little bit covert, which is the doom scroller. You know, how people can get sort of addicted to all the terrible news because of course news has become drugified just like everything else. It's not just, we're not engaged just because we want to know what's going on in the world. We're engaged because the medium itself is reinforcing. Which is, which is, I think that's new. I mean, you know, this yes. sort of, 24 hour yeah. on demand. You can choose the, the, the truth bubble of your choice and operate solely within that. Um, I agree. Yeah. When you think about it physiologically, that's really scary. I mean, I'm old enough to remember like when we had three television stations and uh, yeah, right. And half the day was just those uh, horizontal and vertical colored lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. And, um, and, and, you know, when, when a trusted newsman said and that's the way it was you know that everybody kind right. of that was our common shared reality and now that's really beginning to splinter and what you're talking about here seems to me to be exacerbating a lot of that yes um, it's like it's like the gaping maw of content um that we're all getting hooked on in various forms mm -hmm. um which i think is is leaving you know our lives and our culture and our communities more impoverished yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that occurs to me is, um, you know, we, 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 people talk a lot about polarization and that's sort of a bad thing. And I think we all can, can agree that that's not necessarily a good thing. But what, as you're speaking, I'm just thinking, well, do I get like a dopamine rush if I go on Twitter and say that thing you just said is absolutely stupid, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just kind of laugh. I mean, does that make me feel better? Like in that little instant moment, <laughs> rather than saying, you know, let's have a reasonable discussion about this. Right. 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 Yeah. So yeah. Like the addiction to outrage, there's long been this term rageaholics. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. I think it's that, that idea that we can, you know, uh, dopamine is actually released not just in response to pleasurable stimuli, but if there's an extremely painful stimulus, dopamine is released too, you know, through this sort of opponent process mechanism. Um, if you inject a rat with a single dose of cocaine and cut open its brain, you will see an arborization of dopamine releasing neurons in the reward pathway. If you take that same rat and inject or that same species of rat and, and give it a very painful foot shock, you will see an identical brain change as to a single injection of cocaine. So yes, um, and, and social media is really interesting because of course we are wired to make human connections. Um, human connections, you know, release dopamine. We know that uh, my colleague Rob Malenka has shown that oxytocin, which is a love hormone, actually binds to dopamine releasing neurons in the reward pathway and causes those neurons to release dopamine. There are lots of evolutionary reasons why we you know, need to be social creatures to steward scarce resources, to find mates, to protect ourselves uh, against, you know, uh, invaders or, or enemies. But what's happened today is that social media, again, has allowed um, human connection to be drugified in the sense that um, it's more potent, it's more reinforcing, it's, it's easier to access with almost no effort. It's limitless. So TikTok never runs out. Think about cocaine that would never run out, right? Wow, that would be a lot of cocaine. Um, and th those things really matter in terms of like the addictogenic potential. And of course, one of the ways that we get a feeling of connection is by having the same strong emotion as somebody else at the same time. And so I think this can really drive this kind of mob mentality 
where mm-hmm. you have millions of users who are now outraged together about the same. That's incredibly validating, huge release of dopamine. And, and so I think, you know, for good and for evil, right? I mean, that could be good and it could be bad. Um, but certainly what it does mean is that it's an easy way for us to um, titillate ourselves is to, you know, be outraged about a lot of stuff without actually necessarily doing anything about it. Well, and this connects also to me to the whole theme around storytelling and mm. stories that that we hear. And uh, I've got colleagues who do research in this and what they're able to demonstrate is you can have all the facts and statistics and, you know, whatever you want, but what actually causes people to make up their minds one way or the other are the stories they have woven about about what the um, incident means. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, wow, you know, the fact that I can get all emotionally wrapped up in a story, uh, regardless of its provenance. And my my colleague, uh, Jane Prager, likes to use the example of the TV series, Dexter, Mm-hmm. Uh, which is literally <laughs> about serial killer. And, 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 you know, and all of us sort of in normal society can agree serial killers are probably not great. <laughs> and yet we go into this team and we're like, go for it. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> it's just, it's an absurd premise, right? <laughs> and yet there we are. Uh, so yeah. I think it's really, really fascinating. Um, you also talk about, and we got a couple of comments from uh, people like Frank Kelberg about um, how do we, help. And one of the parts of the book you talk about is um, the the idea of rad- radical honesty and pro-social shame. And I think any of us could could use those tools. So maybe elaborate a little on those. Yeah. So I love that you brought up storytelling because what I, I've observed in my two plus decades of treating patients with addiction is that the kinds of stories that patients tell about their lives Um, are very predictive of whether or not they're in recovery. And patients who tell stories in which they openly and clearly acknowledge how they've contributed to the problem are, have a much better prognosis um, and do much better and have more robust and more sustained recovery than patients who come in and talk about the ways in which everything bad that's happened to them is everybody else's fault. Mm -hmm. And it's really a reliable indicator. And as people go from being in their addiction to being in recovery, you can see their narrative change through that process. And it's really fascinating. Some of those individuals are involved in AA. And of course, working the 12 steps is, you know, to my mind, in large part about writing an AA narrative and an AA narrative, including the steps is about owning your part, acknowledging your character defects, and actually telling another human being uh, and making amends, you know, apologizing to the people that you've harmed, which is, gosh, probably, you know, one of the most difficult and shameful, pro-social shameful things that, you know, that we can do, but um, absolutely vital for healing. Um, And and so, you know, um, this is a really interesting idea, this idea that the stories that we tell about our lives are not just a way to organize the past, but are actually predictive of our future uh, uh, future actions. And that these autobiographical narratives, when they hew closer to the facts, you know, as we can, as best we can gather them with multiple perspectives, uh, that is to say the truer they are, the more likely they are to be um, helpful to us as guideposts going forward. And my patients will tell me that um, they can't lie about anything because if they lie, even about little things, they're likely to relapse. Also really fascinating. Like what is it from a neurobiological perspective that would, would make that an important feature of recovery? And of course, there's the obvious thing that you know, people in their addiction lie about what they're doing. In fact, some people have defined addiction as that thing that I lie about. Um, so in having to tell the truth and be accountable, um, you know, that that's an important part of not using, but it goes beyond that. You know, my patients, uh, one of them said, yeah, when I was in my addiction, I had the lying habit. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I would lie about stuff that didn't even matter. If I was at a Burger King and my friend called me, I'd say, he'd say, where are you? I'd say, I'm at McDonald's. If I was at McDonald's and he called, I said, I'm a Burger King. It was just like, I had to lie about stuff. It became kind of like part of the weft and weave of sort of how I went through the world. And getting into recovery is about what I call the radical honesty, where we don't lie about anything. So how does that work? 
Well, I think it works on a number of different levels. First of all, it works in the sense of we're telling truer autobiographical narratives and thereby creating uh, reliable maps for the future. But it also uh, works in the sense that it, it creates true intimacy. We think that when we expose our foibles and our shameful conduct to people who love us, that they'll leave us. But in fact, the opposite happens. It, it, it causes a deep intimacy and trust, which is a source of really healthy and adaptive dopamine. What's also probably happening when we tell the truth is that we're stimulating our prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is that big gray matter area right behind our foreheads that's essential for delayed gratification, future planning, and also storytelling. So when we look at the brain and see what parts of the brain are lit up when people are telling stories or listening to stories, it's the prefrontal cortex. And the, the fact of the matter is that telling the truth about everything is not our default mode. Mm -hmm. The average adult tells one to two lies per day along the lines of, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late for the meeting. The traffic was terrible. That's not true. I'm late for the meeting because I wanted five extra minutes to read the paper and drink my coffee, right? But if I force myself to tell the truth, then what I'm potentially doing is actually stimulating the prefrontal cortex which is essential for delayed gratification and future planning, connects to the limbic areas, including that pleasure, pain, balance, and reward pathway. And the, and the prefrontal cortex and those deep limbic structures need to be communicating for a healthy brain. We need to have those areas in concert for us to be able to make good choices about our consumption uh, going forward. We are incredibly, we have a, this amazing memory for the initial stimulus of the balance, right? Whether it's pleasure or pain, we are almost universally amnestic for the gremlins. That is to say the opponent process, what comes after that stimulus. And this goes both ways. My, my patients say, I have this incredible euphoric recall for the early days of my drug use. It's hard for me to remember all the bad stuff that follows. Same with me. When I wake up in the morning, the last thing that I want to do is get out of bed and exercise. I cannot remember that yesterday I felt really good after exercising, right? All I can think of is I don't want to get out of bed and exercise. And so there's this fascinating way in which we, we don't have access to that cause and effect experience. And so these autobiographical narratives, both individual and shared, create access for us. And this is also how AA works, right? It's like an extended hippocampus. People go there and they're reminded, right? Oh, yeah. Whoops, I was just minimizing in my brain my drug problem, but that person right there telling their story reminded me. So anyway, that's, that's a lot, but it works on many, many levels. I love that. One of the most memorable images from the book was um, looking at the marshmallow studies. And yes. for those that aren't familiar with them, uh, these scientists basically were looking at how well children could delay gratification by leaving them with a marshmallow, leaving them alone. And they were promised they could have another marshmallow if they didn't eat the first one. But um, for many kids, it was too much. That was too much self-control to expect. But one of the images I loved from, from the book was some of the kids who did manage to hold off. Um, one of the behaviors was actually picking the marshmallow up and sort of stroking it as yes. though it was like a, a pet or something. Um, right. Right. keeping from eating it. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. What a great image too. Yeah. So, and basically that's self-binding, right? So uh, some of the children would turn their back on the marshmallows, right? Creating that sort of, I'm not going to see it. Um, other, uh, I think another child pulled her pigtails or kicked the chair. That's a little bit like using a uh, hormesis or a painful stimulus to distract from you know, the craving. And then this child actually turned it into a sacred object, which is another way that I've seen patients do it too, like a kind of, you know, this is a sacred substance. I will only use this at certain sacred, important festivals or times or occasions. The other interesting twist on that marshmallow experiment that most people haven't heard about is that um, some researchers did a variation where they took those kids that the same experiment, but they divided them in two groups. In one group, they told the child, now, if you, in these 15 minutes while you're waiting for me to come back, if you ring a bell, um, I'll come, and because you have a question or something, I'll, well, I'll come back. And, in the, and, and they divided them in two groups. Now, in the first group, when the kids rang the bell, 
the researcher came right back and, and said, yeah, what, you know, what do you need? In the other group, when the kids rang the bell, they were told the same thing. The researcher didn't come back. So the researcher lied to the child, essentially. And of course, you can guess what's coming. In that group where the child, children were lied to, they were much more likely to not be able to wait. They were much more likely to eat wow. that, that first marshmallow, which also talks uh, you know, to the ways in which this kind of radical honesty is, is literally contagious um, and and can be very in a very insidious way contribute to this kind of um, scarcity. I, I talk about plenty mindset versus scarcity mindset. But when people around us are lying, we get a scarcity mindset even amidst plenty, right? Mm -hmm. And we begin to think, well, I should I better eat that marshmallow because like you can't rely on the people around here, and who knows what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And I hear that. I mean, I'm what's going through my mind is. Uh, a lot of all the conversation we're having about toxic workplaces wow. and you know there, there's been I, i've had a guest on who's an expert in workplace stress and one of the things that that increases workplace stress and i think it connects very well with what you're talking about here is this notion of not having agency so you don't have control over your your outputs not being appreciated indeed being misled or lied to right. on a regular basis mm -hmm. or or at least not told the truth you know and right. and, and 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 um but i'm, I'm fascinated at connecting that to the yeah, the same yeah. neurotransmitter mm -hmm. thing I mean, mm -hmm. you know if you think about a toxic workplace it's like that poor kid along with a marshmallow and yeah it's coming <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd eat that marshmallow too. <laughs> right? <laughs> Most of us would. Yeah. Most of us would. So toward the end of the book, um, you really start talking about the um, the the you know lessons of the balance and and being more attentive. And I think one of the things that really struck me was this kind of here we are in the midst of more plenty mm -hmm. than humanity has ever known. I mean, mm -hmm. most of us are not you know, suffering for basic physical needs. I mean, there are people who are, but most of us aren't. Um, and most of us have, you know, people to talk to and places to be and work that is to some extent rewarding. And yet, and yet, you know, it's almost as though all that abundance is more than our brains can cope with. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's really, you know, where the title comes from, Dopamine Nation. Should it really be Dopamine Nations because it's not just the, U the U.S., you know, it's... <laughs> And what's yeah, so, white <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and what I talk about in the book, which I link to the neuroscience, because I think there is an inferential link there is that, you know, even as um, wealth increases across the globe, um, or I should say, as we have become richer, um, we have also seen rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide go up all over the world. And it's very clear, clearly correlated to, to wealth. The richer the nation, the higher the rates of uh, depression, anxiety, and suicide, and the less happy people are, you know, which is very paradoxical, right? Um, I mean, we, we think we have off all of these goods, all of these uh, wonderful things in our lives, and yet we seem to be less happy than ever. And I, I, I do think it's very possible that an explanation for that is this dopamine, you know, dopamine deficit state that we're actually overloaded with these kinds of pleasures. We're largely insulated from pain, especially physical embodied pain. We're really quite alienated from our own bodies. And that biologically, um, you know, we, we have entered uh, this kind of, again, a kind of a dopamine deficit state that's very akin to depression. And frankly, you know, our current mental health interventions don't work all that well, right? So we're, the more access people have to um, mental health treatment, including psychotropics, doesn't correlate with, uh, you know, decreasing rates of addiction and uh, decreasing rates of, well, that either, uh, decreasing rates of depression and anxiety and suicide. So somehow or another, we are not getting something right. And mm -hmm. I think it may, it may be this problem of, of dopamine overload. Yeah, when I, I wonder, you know, as I think about, um, there was a study, and I can't remember who did it, but there was a study done uh, back in the day when um, settlers were, white settlers were moving into the American colonies. Uh, there would occasionally be um, incidences where someone would leave the kind of very structured white Protestant community and, and be forced or be elect to live with the Indian tribes, who were obviously indigenous people with a less structure, less hierarchy, less 
you know, well off in the sense of material goods, but, um, and the flow was almost universally that way. Like they never came back, even if they had to. <laughs> And what that got me thinking about was, um, when I think about also people who don't have a lot of material goods that I know, and many of them just seem to have these very lovely personal lives. You know, they share what they have, what little they have with each other. And there seems to be a lot more of that kind of oxytocin dopamine kind mm -hmm. of thing going on. And when I think about people that I know who are very wealthy, that, you know, many of them are very alienated, you know, these trust fund kids who grow up yeah. like without knowing what to do with themselves and there's no material want but they're just mm -hmm. very needy <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. of what they don't even know I think well there's probably you know, possibly a bimodal distribution it's very clear that poverty is a risk factor oh yeah and I didn't, all, mean, I didn't yeah, mean yeah no and I know you didn't I know you didn't just, yeah, just yeah. important to clarify you know that's a serious risk for all forms of mental illness including addiction and in fact I think the most vulnerable people are poor people in rich nations um, because they don't have access to the kind of healthier sources of dopamine, like, you know, uh, like fancy gyms or being in nature. And yet there's still enough disposable income to buy, you know, the latest game console or to watch enormous mm -hmm. quantities of Netflix or to go to McDonald's, mm -hmm. um, but not like, you know, not necessarily Draegers or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but yeah, there's also, and I have seen this of course, you know, practicing in the heart of Silicon Valley here, um, yeah, I mean, there's even a term for it called the fail sun, which is really a terrible term. But what? The fail sun? Fail sun, right? It's a kind of a, this, this description of these children of these uber wealthy individuals mm -hmm. who just can't activate, right? They can't, and part of it is the burden of comparison of achievement. But part of it is just like they, there's nothing that they really need to strive for. And, and once that's taken away, it's so fundamental to human motivation uh, that it gets very hard for those individuals to know, well, what is my thing that I should be doing here? And why not just play video games 24 seven? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. This has been so enlightening and I want to be respectful of your time. So those who have tuned in and those who will watch the recording of the, the book is called Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance. And balance actually means something in the context of this book, it means something <laughs> physiological in the context of this book. And, you know, lots of us in management write about balance and whatnot. And we're talking about much, <coughs> much less specific things. Mm. Uh, so what can people do to find out more, to help themselves, to take a next step? Well, um, I mean, I'm not on social media because I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, so, but there is a website for the book, dopamine which has um, also some you know, other resources and publicate related publications if people are interested in, in it. And, and that's, that's about it. Um, you know, people are welcome. They want to email me with specific questions. Um, I try to answer them as best I can. It sometimes takes me some weeks to get, get to all of them, but um, yeah, happy to be of service and be helpful in any way that I can. I so appreciate your taking the time. So one last question is um, how, so let's say you're in denial that you, you, you've got an addiction of some kind and whatever it is, however benign seeming it is. Yeah. Work could be an addiction, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, what are some things you can do to get some feedback about whether that is in fact the case? Yeah, so this is going to sound super redundant, but again, I believe this is this is what I do in clinical practice. I say, you know what? It's not clear that you're addicted. You don't maybe you don't think that you are. Try a dopamine fast for 30 days and let's see how it goes. And that can be revelatory for people. Mm -hmm. That's a great note to uh, end on and that's entirely within your control. Right? That's it. You know, so much of mental health intervention wants to start with thoughts and emotions. And there's a, there's a place for that. But sometimes you just have to act opposite to thoughts and emotions and change behavior. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Anna Lemke, it has been a total pleasure. And this hour has flown. I've learned so much from your book. I appreciate it so much. And it connects to so many things that really need work in our society. So well, thank, you so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I see there are lots of comments and questions in the chat. I, I wish I could have seen them, but um, yeah, what we'll do is we will, I will send also them to me. And Perfect. so what we tend to do is if we don't get to them in real time, we respond yeah. to individuals or we put Perfect. it in, in one of our weekly uh, notes. Oh, great. That's wonderful. Thank great. you so All much. Right. It's been a pleasure talking with you.